as geek is tonight, right, Pastor? Uh, my full-time ministry since 1985 has dealt with the wonderful accuracy of God's Word. However, uh, I did serve in the Air Force Reserve for almost 35 years, and d uh, during my service, I began putting together programs about God and America. And I would present these presentations to mainly military audiences. Well, about 10 years ago, I thought maybe civilian audiences would like this stuff. So we began sharing with civilian audiences, and we've been delighted at the response. Uh, tonight, I'd like to share with you a brand new program. As you might know from this morning, our presentation tonight, we'll be looking at godly tough guys and gals in American history. Now, how's that for a title, right, Pastor? We'll be looking at nine exceptional individuals that did amazing things through the power of prayer and, of course, most of all, the power of Almighty God. Uh, at the end, we can have some time for some questions and comments regarding either what we covered this morning or what we're going to cover this evening. I've always got extra stuff I can share if nobody's got any questions or comments yet. Uh, before we begin, besides thanking you for being here this evening, uh, we've had a ton of interest in the books and DVDs. Um, I went back home. I only live in Tacoma and brought back uh, copies of the books we ran out of this morning. But I would like to mention a couple of recommendations for tonight's uh, presentation. We're talking about a completely different subject. May I ask how many here have heard of Michael Medved? Okay, oh, a number of you, okay, that's good. Uh, Michael Medved is actually an Orthodox Jew, but he loves Christians, and Christians love him. And he's written some wonderful books about God in action in American history. Two of my favorites is this two-volume set here, uh, one is the American Miracle. He covers God in action from colonial times to the Civil War. And then volume two is the Civil War to modern times. Um, I think my favorite chapter in this book here was the Battle of Brooklyn, which virtually nobody's heard of, probably because, folks, it's got God written all over it. We discussed the Battle of Brooklyn in a different program, but I'll just say for right now, folks, the Battle of Brooklyn was the biggest scariest battle of the entire American Revolution, but it is not taught in any schools, even in Christian schools. So there's a whole chapter on the Battle of Brooklyn in here. And then uh, in this book here, we have my favorite chapters on the Battle of Midway. And it is fascinating what historians say about that battle and how a lot of weird stuff happened, folks, in America's favor, thanks to prayer. Anyway, anyway, uh, Michael Medved, um, my favorite expert on America's spiritual heritage. You probably heard of David Barton, and my favorite DVD about that subject is from him. We have that here, America's Godly Heritage. My second favorite, and he's a friend of mine, William J. Federer has written many books about God and America. My favorite reference book is America's God and Country. The entire book is articles about all sorts of people, places, and events. And my favorite section, and we'll be touching upon it tonight, 32 pages on a bulletproof George Washington. Whoops, I'm not going over my display here. I'm trashing things here. All right, I think that's good enough for now. Uh, may I say something before we begin, and I better not chase a rabbit. Um, Obviously, folks, our country is in serious, serious trouble, isn't it? In all kinds of ways, all right? Count them. And many Christians have become very despondent and, frankly, have given up. And I've come across some pastors, not your pastor, uh, if they've got nothing uh, good to say about America, they don't say anything at all, okay? Uh, fact of the matter is, folks, God's still using this country, believe it or not. I have an entire program on 14 spiritual reasons why you can still love America. How's that for a surprise, right? Case in point, our country, folks, translates, publishes, and distributes more copies of the Bible than the entire rest of the world put together. This country is the reason why the Bible continues to be the number one best-selling book in the world. This country, folks. Do you know, except for Israel, this country is the only country on earth that has an annual, official, reoccurring, nationwide day of prayer. We're the only one, folks. Now, I've heard people say, well, a lot of good that's doing. Hey, can you imagine how bad this country would be if we didn't have a day of prayer? <laughs> and speaking of which, our Congress, it opens in prayer every session, and our Congress would be a bigger mess <laughs> if it didn't open in prayer. And by the way, who remembers what extremely unlikely person insisted that Congress always open in prayer? Anybody? 
Benjamin Franklin. They teach in our schools, our founding fathers were all a bunch of deists, which is not true at all. Our most famous deists were Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. Problem for them, guess what? Both of these men were huge fans of prayer and in the providence of God. I don't think they were Christians, but a true deist back then did not believe in prayer. I've read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography twice. It's quite long. It's a little hard to understand sometimes. It is full of references to prayer and the Bible and God, believe it or not. They don't teach that in their schools, do they? All right. I digress. Just a couple more things, okay? Um, our country in spite of everything that's doing wrong, our country sends out more missionaries than any other, and our country spends more money on spreading the gospel than the entire rest of the world put together. And one more, and I, I think Pastor and I are on the same page regarding the nation of Israel and how God feels about Israel. Is that right, Pastor? Folks, without America, no Israel. God is using this country to look after the nation of Israel. And I'll give you a quick example among many others. Israel has been in five major wars. The most desperate war was the Yom Kippur War, the October War of 1973. You've probably heard about that lately because the current uh, conflict right now is the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, all right? Long story short, Egypt and Syria launched massive surprise attacks against the Israelis. Bad, bad, bad. Gold in the air appealed to the UN and said, do something. We are outnumbered 50 to 1. We cannot survive. We will be overrun. There will be another Holocaust. Nothing. Only one country stood up, the United States of America. It was called Operation Nickelgrass, and hardly anybody's heard of it. <laughs> Operation Nickelgrass was the biggest airlift in history. Military Airlift Command, in one month, the month of October, every hour on the hour had a C-141 or C-5A landing at Lod Airport outside Jerusalem with 22,000 tons of munitions, 568 flights. And what's amazing about this is MAC, Military Airlift Command, suspended all safety regulations and all inspections, and yet we still didn't lose a single airplane. It was astonishing, folks. At any rate, at any rate, I could give you a couple of stories about that, uh, one of them being, uh, Moshe Diane, the defense minister, went to Golden Meir. They just finished having a movie about her and the Yom Kippur War. At any rate, she said, Golda, she says, we can't hold our lines. Tomorrow morning, the frontier will be breached by the Egyptians. And she asked him, well, well what can we do about it? There's nothing we can do about it. We need more heavy artillery ammunition. And she smiled and says, Moshe, 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 you must have more faith. Three hours later, the first American cargo plane arrived from Travis Air Force Base, a C-5A Galaxy Transport, with 91 tons of heavy artillery ammunition. The Israelis had no way to unload it. They had three busloads of teenagers from a kibbutz <laughs> come and they hand unloaded all the ammunition. Three hours later after that, the ammunition was being used in combat. The following morning, the Star of David was still flying over their frontier lines. God has been using this country, folks, in spite of itself. By the way, on a funny note, a friend of mine who's now with the Lord uh, was a young loadmaster aboard a C-141, and uh, I, he told me that he, his plane was the first one to land at Lod Airport. And I went, wow. I said, Dell, I said, uh, I understand that the Israelis had their flight attendants from LL Airlines greet you guys under runway. They rolled out a red carpet and their, their stewardesses hugged you guys and kissed you and gave you candy and flowers and fruit. He goes, yeah, yeah that, that happened all right, but not to me. <laughs> I said, well, what happened to you, Dell? An elderly lady gave me an, a jar of olives <laughs> and a hug, no kiss. <laughs> oh, well, oh, okay. Do you know who that lady was? Gold in the air. <laughs> okay, folks, I'm getting carried away. Sorry. That has nothing to do with our program, but it has to do with the fact God is using this country. And he's not quite done yet, is he? So we have to keep on keeping on for him. And please, 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 folks, vote, vote, vote. Vote once, but vote. All right? <laughs> please. All right. I've said too much. Sorry, Pastor. Can we have the lights, please? I think we're all scored away here. Yeah. 
And let's see, where was it? Oh, I'm standing over here, okay. Okay, thank you for your patience. Thank you for letting me go on and on there. Godly, tough guys and gals in American history. We're going to only look at nine examples, or many more than that. We start with the bulletproof general. George Washington became almost as famous for being on his knees in prayer as he was on his horse in combat. George Washington, in fact, said, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly implore his protection and favor. Washington knew what he was talking about. I call this the nine lives of George Washington. Historians note George Washington was in about 30 major battles. He was in the thick of almost all those battles. And in eight of those battles, he should have been killed. How he survived all eight of them is astronomically <coughs> unlikely. I'm all choked up again. The most famous of these battles, you might have heard of it, the Monongahela Massacre during the French and Indian War. George Washington was declared dead. He wrote his brother and he said, but by providence I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt. But the Monongahela Massacre wasn't the main uh, episode in Washington's career where God looked out for him, in my humble opinion, by the way. I believe there were other examples, and we can talk about these during Q&A if you want. Washington said he came the closest to death during the French and Indian War, during the Battle of Fort Duquesne. And then also at Kipps Bay, very bizarre. He was almost killed in Ma Manhattan. Following the Delaware River crossing, he was almost killed in Trenton, New Jersey. My favorite example, folks, which we can discuss during Q&A, the Battle of Princeton. This is an a, as a obvious example of God looking out for him. The Battle of Brandywine was noteworthy as the Battle of Monmouth and the Battle of Yorktown. We talk all about this more in another program. Tonight, folks, this is just kind of an, an overview, if you will, okay? President Calvin Coolidge was an expert on George Washington. He was a fan, and he said, thank the divine providence which kept him, George Washington, to serve and inspire his fellow man. I'm not an expert, but I've read 11 biographies about George Washington. I've tried to read them from conservative sources and liberal ones. Ron Chernow wrote one of the latest ones, and he admitted, despite his own background, even as a young man, Washington seemed to possess a magical immunity to bullets. This led one Indian chief to predict that some higher power was guiding him to great events in the future. If you're ever in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., they have a prayer room. It's dominated by a giant, beautiful stained glass window of Washington in prayer with his favorite verse, Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. But good question. Was Washington a Christian? Well, there are many things we could say. We do so in our George Washington program. For right now, may I quote from his prayer journal. He wrote, Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb, and purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Thou gavest thy Son to die for me, and hast given me assurance of salvation. What do you think? Folks, as far as I know, there are three major volumes about George Washington's faith. The biggest one, by far, and took me a long time to get through it, Sacred Fire. There are others and articles, but the author of Sacred Fire, he concluded the only legitimate conclusion that can be drawn from this evidence is that Washington was an advocate of and a believer in the Christian faith. But for the sake of time, we've got to move on because we've got eight more episodes to share with you. We now turn to two naval heroes. There are two different episodes that I think are very bizarre during the War of 1812. We discussed the Battle of Washington, D.C. in one program. Tonight, the Battle of Lake Erie. Our two heroes, Oliver Hazard Perry and his new wife, Elizabeth C. Perry. Oliver Perry was a young American naval commander and he was given impossible orders. He was to go to the Great Lakes area and raise up an American fleet and stop the world's biggest navy. That's all, no pressure. Well, as you can imagine, Elizabeth, who was very intelligent, realized this was really bad. 
she tearfully hugged her husband goodbye and assured him that she and her friends and relatives would all be praying for him and his men. We're glad that they were praying. They did raise up a fleet, the Americans, and they did engage the British forces on September 10th, 1813 in Lake Erie. The Americans fought long and hard, but they were outgunned, outmanned, and totally inexperienced. The British fleet had a field day. One by one, they began sinking our ships. They sank the USS Lawrence, which was the flagship of the American flotilla. Perry gave, very reluctantly, the order to abandon ship. The survivors and he rowed across a half a mile of any enemy-held water under constant enemy fire. Nobody thought they would make it, but they did. However, nobody was cheering about it. They reached the USS Niagara, their last major warship. They figured by the end of the day, they would all be dead or captured. They didn't stand a chance. However, folks, something very bizarre happened. The wind suddenly changed direction and with great force. Perry was surprised, but he recovered and he gave the order to attack. Sailing at flank speed, the USS Niagara sailed directly through the entire enemy flotilla. Every gun was blazing. The Niagara began firing full broadside simultaneously in both directions at once. They had the wind. The British didn't. They were sitting ducks. They couldn't maneuver at all. The USS Niagara sailed through the enemy fleet with hardly a scratch. During that first attack run, though, the Niagara crippled three of the enemy's largest warships. And the Niagara was only getting started. She came hard about for a second attack run. The wind continued to favor the Niagara. The British fleet was becalmed. They were sitting ducks again. The British commander was a brave, very experienced officer who served under Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar against Napoleon, he was stunned. He had never seen anything like it. His ships were defenseless, couldn't move, and the Niagara was coming back for some more. He knew it would be a massacre. He did the unthinkable. For the first time in the history of the Royal Navy, one of her officers struck his colors in the middle of combat. He surrendered. Perry contacted his superior, and he wrote, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Perry became an international celebrity for what he did, although folks, I think that's what God did through him. He was, by the way, 28 years old. <laughs> Today, the US Navy honors the memory of Perry with an entire class of frigates called the Oliver Perry class. Perry appealed before Congress and said, it is please the almighty to give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. But right after the battle, Perry told his exhausted but cheering crew, after he wiped out all the soot and dirt and sweat and tears out of his eyes, and he said, the prayers of my wife are answered. There's a book, actually three books out now, about women and prayer. So guys, watch out when the ladies pray. <laughs> Truly, with God, all things are possible. But yet, again, we've got to move on here, folks, to Jedediah's journeys. His name, Jedediah Smith, perhaps America's most famous mountain man. He was also a renowned map maker, a cartographer. His maps would be used for decades. And he was a missionary. He had many adventures. He escaped two Indian massacres. He was in all sorts of skirmishes with bad guys. His most famous exploit, and this has been documented several times, it's hard to believe, but there it is. He was with two colleagues in the Rocky Mountains, and they were attacked by a grizzly bear. Long story short, the grizzly bear got Jedediah Smith's head inside his mouth. Jedediah Smith managed to extricate himself, but in doing so, and ladies, please bear with me here, in doing so, Almost his entire scalp and one ear was torn off and was hanging by a quarter of an inch of flesh. <laughs> he put the top of his head back on and gave his friends instructions as to how to sew him back together again. For the rest of his life, he had a quarter inch scar that all the way around the top of his head, which is why he would comb his hair over to one side and look like a permanent beatnik. Now folks, if that's not a tough guy, I don't know what a tough guy is. But guess what? 
He was a very devout Christian. He never swore. He rarely drank. He was sexually pure. And he carried two books all the time, the Journal of Lewis and Clark and the Bible. It would be Jedediah Smith who would see more of the American West for decades, more than almost any other person. He would map it, and he's given a credit for mapping out the Oregon Trail. Historians have rediscovered Jedediah Smith. There are more and more books and films coming out about him. Indeed, the History Channel has a 10-part series called America, the Story of Us. One entire episode is about Jedediah Smith. And there's another, I think it's a 12-part series called Into the West. And it emphasizes Jedediah Smith and does a great job of portraying his Christian testimony. And he's also been portrayed in less dignified ways uh, in other sources. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised in L.A. on Wilshire Boulevard, I came across a monument to Jedediah Smith. And it called him an explorer, a fur trader, and a missionary. More and more things are being named after Jedediah Smith. And incidentally, uh, may I mention this, may I ask how many here have been to Fort Vancouver by chance? Okay, a couple of you. That was the major place in the Pacific Northwest for decades, and it was one of the headquarters for Jedediah Smith. So it's only two hours from here, and you might uh, find it very interesting to go there sometime. Speaking of which, at the end of the Oregon Trail, there's this sign, and it reads, Jedediah Smith had three ambitions, to serve his God, to provide for his family, and to become a great American explorer. In all three things, he succeeded. But Smith was a very devout Christian that becomes terribly obvious when you read his journal. And he said, How often ought we on our bended knees to offer our grateful acknowledgments for the gift of his dear son? Is it possible that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? One of his favorite verses, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But next, we come to Chamberlain's Charge. Abraham Lincoln became almost as famous as George Washington for his prayer, and that turned out to be a very good thing. Case in point, Abraham Lincoln said, I ask him or God to help us and give us victory now. I'm sure my prayer was answered. I had no misgiving about the result at Gettysburg. God used a very unlikely person at Gettysburg. In fact, he was a geek. His name was Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He was a very scholarly college professor at Bowdoin College in Maine. But because of his Christian convictions regarding slavery and other issues, he was commissioned into the Union Army. He rose up through the ranks, even though he was a rookie, an amateur. And, long story short, he became the commanding officer of the 20th Maine Regiment. The 20th Maine at the Battle of Gettysburg was given impossible orders too. The superiors thought that he had a full-size regiment of 1,000 men. He didn't. He had 300 survivors left after the Battle of Fredericksburg. Nevertheless, he was given orders to hold the little round top. It was a small, very small mountain that anchored the far left flank of the Union position. It was extremely strategic. Whoever held the little round top was going to win the battle. Well, our Confederate friends, they wanted that mountain very, very badly. They wanted to put artillery up there and break the entire Union position. Four times the 15th Alabama and other Confederate units slammed into the regiment under Joshua Chamberlain. After the fourth charge, the Sergeant Major came to Joshua Chamberlain and said, Sir, we cannot hold a fifth attack. But Chamberlain, one of his favorite verses was, With us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. It's fairly well done. Uh, the three-part series Gettysburg that was put up by Turner. Uh, in fact, when I was in Air War College, I had an opportunity to tour the Gettysburg battlefield site for a day, and our tour guide was Turner's top historian. He has more books about Gettysburg than any other person in the entire world. He is the definitive authority on it. And he confirmed that most of the film was, was very, very accurate. At any rate, folks, in the film, it depicts Chamberlain in a very positive way, including his Christian testimony. 
and it depicts how the sergeant major came to him and begged Chamberlain to either retreat or surrender. Chamberlain said, we have our orders. We are to hold this hill to the very last man. We can't surrender and we cannot withdraw. Well, his sergeant major says, sir, we can't hold. He says, you're right, we can't hold. There's only one thing we can do. We're going to attack, which is extremely counterproductive, totally. But it worked. Chamberlain personally led a bayonet charge. He had less than 100 men left. He was outnumbered five to one. But at the beginning of the charge, a Confederate captain leveled a 36 caliber revolver six feet away at Chamberlain's chest. He pulled the trigger, nothing happened. He pulled the trigger again, nothing happened. At this point, he decided this would be a good time to surrender. Chamberlain, after the successful charge and the victory there, found that revolver and discovered it worked perfectly. This secular historian wrote, if there truly was a moment on which the outcome of the Civil War hinged, it occurred in Little Round Top when Joshua Chamberlain organized a defense and defeated attacking Confederates in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Chamberlain would be decorated with the Medal of Honor. He received many other decorations. He'd be promoted to the rank of Major General. After the war, he would become the president of Bowdoin College and be elected the governor of Maine twice. I thought it was very interesting Historians tell us that Chamberlain, after every battle, would cry about all his friends, all his comrades that had died that day. Word got out that Joshua Chamberlain, he had the heart of a woman, but the soul of a lion. Chamberlain said things like this, my heart and mind are at peace. Jesus Christ is my all-sufficient savior. I can trust my own life and the welfare of my family in the hands of providence. I believe in a destiny divinely appointed. Back to Abraham Lincoln, though. Was he a Christian? Well, Lincoln said, I was not a Christian, but when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Yes, I do love Jesus. But moving on, since we're at the Civil War now, one more comment. The battlefield angel. Nursing in general, folks, up until the end of the 19th century was really medieval. It was really sad. We're very grateful to people like Florence Nightingale from Britain and Clara Barton. Clara Barton became famous for pioneering military nursing. She saved countless lives, both uh, her team as well as her policies that were adopted. She became known as the angel of the battlefield, the American Nightingale, Courageous Clara, and my personal favorite, Bulletproof Barton. <laughs> Clara Barton served during the American Civil War in some of the worst battles, and then after the Civil War, she went overseas to help save the lives of many other soldiers in European battles. And the thing about Clara Barton, folks, is she wasn't content to stay behind. For example, during the horrible battle of Fredericksburg, where she became very famous, this was the mansion that she commandeered for a field hospital, but she didn't stay there. Clara Barton became America's first combat field nurse. She was out there in the thick of it. After a battle, she would sew up the holes in her dresses from all the bullets that were flying around. But there was a controversy about her. Word got out, Clara Barton was bulletproof. She couldn't be killed. So. Some men said, you know what? In a battle, you better be, better be near her because she's bulletproof. The Lord's going to protect her and you. Other men said, you dummies, the bullets that miss her will hit you instead. <laughs> so you want to stay away from Clara Barton. I don't know which side won. Anyway, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And it certainly seems to apply to Clara Barton. William McKinley, president, was a very devout Christian. He heard about Clara Barton, and he said, we are constantly reminded of our obligations to the divine master for his watchful care. Clara Barton would go on to become the founder of the American Red Cross, and she would say things like, Christ, teach my soul a prayer that would plead to the Father for grace sufficient. God, pity and strengthen everyone. Thy will, O God, 
be done. And as I said, she became the founder of the Red Cross. Later on, Woodrow Wilson, he heard all about this, and he commented, this cross, which these ladies bear, is an emblem of Christianity itself. More and more things are being named after Clara Barton. She's receiving more and more recognition, and there are all sorts of excellent books like this one about her. But moving on, we come to the 20th century. We come to the story of the hillbilly hero. A few years ago, a survey was taken of American high school students. The students were asked, who was America's greatest fighting hero ever? Folks, I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I'm embarrassed for our country. Do you know what the answer was? Rambo. <laughs> Newsflash. Rambo was fictitious. There was no Rambo. <laughs> this is bad. On top of that, folks, there was somebody who made Rambo look like a wimp. And that somebody was a very unlikely person, Alvin C. York. Alvin C. York, folks, did not start out very well in life. He was a hillbilly, a hick from the hills of Tennessee. So was my mother, although she was from West Virginia. He was a scoundrel. He made the Beverly Hillbillies look like city slickers by comparison. He was a heavy drinker. He was violent. He always carried a gun. He enjoyed interrupting church services on Sunday morning by riding around and around the church, firing off a shotgun. He was a bum. But his mother never stopped praying for him, and he got saved very dramatically, I might add. Boy, did he get saved. The Bible tells us, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Folks, he got so saved, he became a pacifist. He stopped drinking. He became the choir director. <laughs> but the U.S. Army came a-knocking during the First World War. And they said, Uncle Sam wants you. And he said, I'm a pacifist. Uncle Sam can pass away, pass on, do something, but I'm not going anywhere. Well, long story short, a Christian infantry captain convinced York that he had a duty to do the right thing, to fight for right. So York reluctantly was drafted into the U.S. Army, and he was shipped over there. He served in several battles, but the battle that made him famous was in October of 1918. It's simply called the Battle of Hill 223. His company was ordered to go out on a reconnaissance in force, and they came head on into an enemy machine gun battalion that virtually wiped out every man. All that was left was, at this time, Corporal York and eight American privates. Everybody else had been shot killed or wounded, including all officers and non-commissioned officers. Well, Gary Cooper portrays Sergeant York in the famous 1941 film, Sergeant York. May I ask, how, has anybody seen Sergeant York by chance? Okay, some of you. Folks, this was the top movie of 1941 and got eight Academy Awards. <laughs> and it's fairly accurate, although on a humorous note. Sergeant York handpicked Gary Cooper to portray him but he should have done his homework first. It turns out that Gary Cooper was quite the ladies' man. He was quite the drinker, quite the smoker, and carouser. And York was appalled. <laughs> and throughout the entire movie, York was on Cooper's case about his conduct. So Cooper was very happy to be done with his role. <laughs> At any rate, folks, as far as our, our story is concerned, Alvin York couldn't bear the thought of any more of his friends being killed York said a prayer, told his men to stay where they were, took a deep breath, and he counterattacked an entire German machine gun battalion by himself. Three and a half hours later, it was over. Sergeant York took out 25 enemy soldiers, captured 29 machine gun positions, and took 132 prisoners. Now, if you think that's hard to believe, that's what General Pershing said. General Pershing said, I want this investigated thoroughly. They investigated York twice, and finally they concluded everything they'd heard was correct, mainly because they interviewed all four of the German officers that York captured. All four officers independently confirmed that York had done all these things, and they were very jealous. 
And they said, we wish we'd had men like York on our side. York would win and be awarded more decorations and more medals than any other American during the First World War. Folks, he received 49 of them, including the Medal of Honor. York, though, he kept giving God all the credit, and he said, I believe in continual prayer. A higher power than man guided and watched over me and told me what to do. It was God's power that saved me. Truly, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. However, York was only human, folks. There were things that he was afraid of. He was very nervous around the ladies, and he did wind up marrying a very nice Christian girl, but he was all thumbs when it came to dealing with the fair gender. But there was something else that terrified him too. It was motorcycles. He was scared to death of riding a motorcycle. He said he'd rather attack another enemy battalion of machine gunners than ride a motorcycle. And he commented, it was asking too much of God traveling like that. <laughs> How many motorcycle riders do we have here? Okay, you have more courage than Sergeant York. Give yourself a medal. Next, we turn to the Second World War and to Patton's prayer. The U.S. Third Army was on its way to becoming the most successful American army in our history and one of the most successful in the history of Europe. But then the sky fell, literally. In December of 1944, the weather turned terrible. The worst weather in 100 years. For Adolf Hitler, unfortunately, that was an ideal thing. It was wonderful cover for him to launch one last major counterattack. It became known as the Ardennes Campaign, but better known to the Americans as the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge was the longest, bloodiest battle in U.S. military history. It was absolutely awful. The weather was so bad, our P-47 Thunderbolt tank, buster, tank busters could not fly, and the enemy Tiger tanks and Panther tanks had a field day knocking out our Sherman tanks. Furthermore, our C-47 transports couldn't fly at all. They couldn't airdrop desperately needed supplies to the 101st Airborne Division that was hanging on by their fingernails, trying to defend Bastogne, a Belgian town, from the enemy. It was only the 101st Airborne and surviving units against three times as many German soldiers who, unfortunately, were extremely well supplied. They had armor support, artillery support. They had everything they needed. The situation was very grim. If we lost Bastogne, we would lose the Battle of the Bulge, and the war would go on for another bloody year at least. Well, enter a man named George, an unlikely hero in this case. But FDR called him his favorite general and called him a pure joy. <laughs> the German high command determined that General Patton was the number one top Allied commander. Indeed, Hitler hated two people the most during World War II. Number one was Winston Churchill, and number two was George S. Patton. Hitler offered a very spectacular bounty for the heads of either one of these individuals. Now, folks, Patton was not a perfect person. For one thing, he was known for his profanity. But, folks, I tend to focus on his positive qualities. Number one, Patton was a prayer warrior, something fierce. He prayed every morning and every evening. His valet testifies to that. He read his Bible every day. And in fact, I've seen his Bible. It's on display at the U.S. Army Armor Warfare Museum at Fort Knox, Kentucky. His Bible is full of notes and outlines and circles and arrows and all this sort of thing. He never missed chapel. Although, uh, I think he'd have a tough time with Baptist preachers. George S. Patton could not tolerate a sermon longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> if a chaplain went past 10 minutes, the chaplain would get fired. So, pastor, watch it. <laughs> anyway, folks, what's my point? Patton had his shortcomings, and yes, he did swear a lot, but you know what? I think I would rather have a man 
who swore a lot and prayed a lot than a man who did not swear and did not pray either. George S. Patton, folks, was so big on God, he had twice as many chaplains in his army as any other army in history. He had 468 ministers, chaplains, serving under him. George S. Patton did something, two things really, really bizarre. Number one, he issued a training letter number five. Training letter number five was sent to 32 officers and non-commissioned officers in his army, giving them instructions as to why and how to pray and how to get their men to pray. I kid you not, I have a copy of it. And then he called his senior chaplain, Chaplain James O'Neill. He said, I need a weather prayer. Long story short, James O'Neill wrote a prayer Patton loved it. The two of them got together and decided to put out a business card with the prayer on one side and a Christmas greeting from Patton on the other side of the card. And we have one of these cards on display at our resource table if you want to take a look at it. The bottom card is the real card, but of course there's two sides to it. So the top card in that little display case is a replica of the front of the card. At any rate, at any rate, Patton loved that prayer card. He gave orders that every single man and woman in his army get a copy of that card. 250,000 of them. The back of the card with the prayer says, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate winds with which we've had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee, that armed with thy power we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Amen. Patton himself would go to this Luxembourg cathedral to pray. He instructed his men to have all their friends and loved ones back home to pray, pray, pray. Patton pivoted his entire army 90 degrees they had been heading due east into Germany, but instead they marched north to Bastogne to save the 101st Airborne Division. They marched nonstop for three days straight through the mud and the snow. But guess what happened? As a result of the prayers, the skies cleared, the P-47s took off and began taking out enemy tanks. The C-47s began airdropping supplies to Bastogne on December 26, 1944, Patton's 4th Armored Division blasted through the enemy lines and, and lifted the siege of Bastogne. On the 23rd of December, Patton prayed to the Lord in a cathedral, all I request is four days of clear weather so that I may dispatch the entire enemy army as a, get ready for this, a birthday present to your Prince of Peace. <laughs> four days later, he went back to the same cathedral and he said, he, he would just address the Lord as sir. He said, sir, this is Patton again and I beg to report complete progress. Patton lamented that he only asked for four clear days of weather. He said, I would have asked for, tw for six days if I'd been thinking straight. Well, folks, I kept my fingers crossed. I held my breath. I researched U.S. military weathered records during the Battle of the Bold, six weeks, Folks, guess what? The only four clear days of weather in a row were the four clear days that Patton prayed for. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Patton's public affairs officer reported, thousands of Third Army men believe the Lord worked a true modern miracle in answer to General Patton's prayer for aid to turn the tide at the Battle of the Bulge. Which brings us to the 1970 film Patton starring George C. Scott. May I ask how many have seen that film? Oh, I highly recommend it. Music is great. At the end of the film, they have the story of Patton's prayer. The Weather Channel has a series called The 100 Biggest Weather Moments in History. They have an entire episode called A Prayer for Good Weather, Patton's Prayer, narrated by four-star general Wesley Clark. I almost fell out of my chair, Pastor, when Wesley Clark said in his opinion as a military historian that Patton's prayer was a deciding factor 
and the victory at Bastogne. A few years ago, uh, 2010, the LA Times, which is not a Christian publication, had a feature article about Patton's prayer. The article concludes, his prayer was answered, the weather miraculously cleared, and Patton broke through the German defenses and relieved Bastogne. By the way, while I'm at it, I, if I could make a personal comment, please. This is Private First Class R.G. Hopper. He served under General Patton from D-Day until the end of the war. He's very happy here in this photograph because the war is over, he's still alive. His best friend was killed right next to him during savage street fighting during the Battle of St. Lowe's shortly after D-Day. I'm glad that Private Hopper survived because a few years later after World War II, he would get married and he'd have a family. He'd have a little girl named Penny who'd become my wife. Since we're at World War, uh, World War II, we should make a comment about the medic on Hacksaw. May I ask how many here have seen Hacksaw Ridge? Okay, a few of you. Hacksaw Ridge, folks, is the semi-accurate story of Desmond Doss, a U.S. Army combat field medic who served during the Pacific Theater of Operation World War II. I've, I'm not an expert, but I've read all three of the books about him. Unfortunately, Hollywood, I don't know if they read these books or not, but it's Hollywood, folks. I'm being rude, aren't I, Pastor? All right, folks, I'm sorry. You can trust a Hollywood TV program or film as long as they have nothing to do with the military or the Bible or history or science or archaeology or, the mili or uh, 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 lawyers, medical practice, sociology. No, folks, we can't trust Hollywood. But we can always trust the Bible, can't we? <laughs> folks, if you saw the movie, you'll remember that our hero here supposedly was beaten up by his colleagues, he was arrested, he was court-martialed, he was thrown into stockade. None of that happened. <laughs> it's all made up. Very, very dramatic, though. However, the film does a great job of depicting the Christian relationship that he had with his, his wife, Dottie, who was a nurse. And it's true, as depicted in the film, Dottie gave him her New Testament to read when he went off into battle. He became famous for reading that New Testament every morning and every evening. And folks, he became very famous because Desmond Doss took the Bible very seriously when it says, pray without ceasing. Desmond Doss prayed, 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 and then after that, he prayed some more. And it was a good thing. He became famous for his heroism. He became famous for all the lives that he saved in the Pacific Theater of Operation during the Second World War. He was decorated for valor after the Battle of Guam and after the Battle of Leyte Gulf. None of that was mentioned in the film. But folks, nobody, including Doss, was ready for the horror of the Battle of Okinawa and the combat involving the Hacksaw Ridge uh, a mountain there. One company of American infantry after the other were thrown at Hacksaw Ridge. Each company was virtually wiped out. Desmond Doss's company was ordered in next. At first, things were going very well. Then there was a massive enemy counterattack. And the Americans were ordered to retreat under heavy fire and after very heavy casualties. Everybody ran away except for Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss could not bear the thought of leaving over 100 wounded Americans to die in the dirt. He stayed behind. Unarmed as a medic, behind enemy lines, outnumbered, obviously, and under constant enemy fire, and believe it or not, also American artillery fire, Desmond Doss began to save the lives of one man after the other. He'd find an American, patch him up, and then lower him down a 60-foot-tall cliff. Every time he saved a man, he'd pray, please, Lord, help me get one more. That went on for almost 24 hours. Long story short, he became renowned throughout the entire division for his raw courage, his physical stamina, his devotion to duty, his faith in God. Incidentally, the U.S. Army documented that he saved the lives of 97 men. 
Das was scrupulously honest and said, no, I only say 52 men. <laughs> they decided to compromise, and on his citation for his Medal of Honor, he's given credit for saving the lives of 75 men. <laughs> but he wasn't done, folks. He went on to save many more men during the Battle of Okinawa. He had previously played Spider-Man. When he saw the script for Hacksaw Ridge, he begged Mel Gibson to give him the part because he says, I want to play a real superhero. If you ever go to San Antonio, Texas, after you see the Alamo, may I recommend, among other things, the very, very impressive U.S. Army Medical Military Museum. They have a monument to the six combat medics who were decorated with the Medal of Honor during World War II. Here they are in more detail, including Desmond Doss. Folks, I served in the Air Force Reserve for almost 35 years, and one of my duties later on was to write citations for medals. I read a whole lot of citations. I wrote a whole lot of citations. I have never, ever seen a citation for a medal like the one that Desmond Doss received, his Medal of Honor. Here's a real Desmond Doss with his wife, Dottie, and here he is being decorated by Harry Truman with the Medal of Honor. And folks, you know he's got to be somebody because he's got his own action figure. <laughs> One of his favorite verses, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Last but not least, folks, we now come to jungle missionaries. It was called Operation Aka 1956, Five very brave, very devoted young American missionaries decided that they were going to try and reach the most savage tribe on earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They went to Ecuador to try and reach the savage Aka Indians. They spent three months reaching out to the Aka Indians, establishing a relationship with them. Things were looking terrific. And then nobody knows for sure what happened. Well, on one horrible afternoon, each one of these men were slaughtered in cold blood by the Aka Indians. It became known as the Aka Indian Massacre. Left behind were five grieving young widows and two little children. Life magazine came out with this feature issue here. But folks, a year and a half later, they came out with a second issue. I have copies of both of these. That's where this, these photographs come from. What happened? Well, folks, two of the ladies, Marjorie Saint and Elizabeth Elliot, went back to the Aka Indian tribe by themselves, unarmed. When they got done, they led half of the tribe to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth Elliot personally led to the Lord the man who killed her own husband. As a result of their inspiration, it's conservatively estimated that over 5,000 young Americans, inspired by their example, became missionaries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are various books and articles about the Aka Indian Massacre, about Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. My personal favorite is the one written by Elizabeth Elliot a year after the massacre. She's only 28 years old, called Through Gates of Splendor. I believe it's still in print. If it's not, you can always get it on eBay or Amazon. If you read it, though, I would recommend very readily that you have a handkerchief handy, folks. The Eliots believe, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. By the way, I left out something kind of amusing. The Aka Indians gave Elizabeth Elliot a nickname. They called her the Woodpecker because she just wouldn't quit. <laughs> It's because of terribly brave, gutsy people like Jim and Elizabeth Elliot that the United States of America, with all of its flaws, is the headquarters for worldwide gospel missions. Once again, folks, God still has uses for this country. Indeed, folks, I got choked up, Pastor, when I came across this article online. Reuters is a very liberal news service, but they had an article called In a 200-Year Tradition, most Christian missionaries are American. In the article I read, the author admitted, if you go overseas and you come across a missionary, that missionary will almost always be an American. 
And again, folks, there are other spiritual reasons for loving our country and trusting that God is not done with us yet. There's still some spiritual tread left, folks, on America's tires that God can utilize if we'll keep on keeping on for him. Well, we could go on and on, but some of you are probably thinking, let my people go. Could we have the lights, please? I want to thank you for coming. Again, I hope this is worth your while. We hope and pray, as we mentioned this morning, if there's anybody here who's not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, their Creator and Savior, that you'll do so tonight. And we hope and pray that all of us are living for Him. We hope and pray that we're making proud the memory of Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, for example. By the way, uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Ned Saint, who was one of the five men killed, he was their pilot, uh, brought the man that Elizabeth Elliot led to the Lord who killed her husband. He brought, he, uh, he brought him to America and went on a speaking tour about 20 years ago, something like that. And I heard about that. I was out of town, but I, my, my wife went and met this guy. And through broken English, uh, this man told my wife, the number one thing that surprised America are supermarkets. <laughs> he said, I walk in big, big room, food everywhere. <laughs> That was his biggest surprise. Anyway, any questions or comments before we shove off tonight? Who's your favorite missionary? Who's my favorite missionary? Yes. Well, I'd have to say is Elizabeth Elliot. I mean, that's a gutsy gal, folks. I don't. I mean, I don't care how you put it. I mean, I mean, she and another woman all by themselves go back to an entire, almost Stone Age tribe and lead half the people to the Lord. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't do that. She's got more courage than I do. <laughs> so I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> Anyone else? May I share with you? Oh, yes, sir. Why was the Battle of Princeton your favorite battle? Oh, okay, glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> the Battle of Princeton occurred right after the Battle of Trenton, and the Americans were scared to death of British bayonets, and with good reason. These things are 18 inches long, and they're three-sided. And I don't think I'm going to, in front of the ladies here, I don't think I'm going to tell you how the British bayoneted people. It was really awful, okay? The Americans are scared to death of these, and the Americans had not yet actually fought a set-piece battle with the British yet, when one row versus another row of men. They had never done that before. The British were used to doing that, okay? Anyway, George Washington got his men all lined up, the British had got all their guys all lined up, and Washington could not get our men to advance. And I don't blame them. I mean, they were scared, okay? George Washington rides out in the middle of no man's land between the two lines, okay? Now, the operational range of the British Brown Best Musket was 80 yards, which by today's standards is not very good at all, but <laughs> 80 yards, okay, all right? That meant back then... If they fired at you from 80 yards away, there's a 50% chance they would hit you, okay? George Washington rides out in front of his men, and he got within 30 yards of the British line. His chances of being shot are excellent now. He's basically riding a horse in front of a great big long firing squad. Nobody knows who fired the first shot, but both sides open fire on each other. Now, this is black powder. Okay, so lots and lots of smoke, all right? Lots and lots of dirt, dust, everything like that, okay? Washington's aide, I just forgot his name, he's a colonel, uh, he covered his face to cover his, uh, his, his tears because Washington's dead, okay? I mean, it's all over, okay? The dust settles, both sides stop firing, and there's an audible gasp on both sides. Both sides cannot believe it. George Washington is on his horse, completely unscathed after all of that. And he, he wrote and, and turned to his men and said, what are you waiting for? Well, he didn't need any urging, boy. These guys go, wow, this guy can't be killed. And the Americans won a great battle. Folks, there's no way, humanly speaking, he could possibly have survived. I mean, even his horse didn't get shot. So I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir, way in the back. Did you hear uh, Richard Nixon's connection with Golda Meir uh, in The Greatest Terrorist of All Time? And what was the last thing you said? In The Greatest Terrorist of All Time. 
Uh, I've heard several things. I don't know for sure which one you're referring to. Oh, yeah, well, that's a true story, too, yeah. His mother warned him that God loved the nation of Israel and that he should always uh, st stand up for the, the Israelis, and he did. In fact, um, the Air Force Chief of Staff asked Nixon how much of an airlift did Nixon want to aid the beleaguered Israelis, and Nixon said, send everything that flies. The U.S. Air Force sent, had 568 missions. <laughs> That is a whole lot of airplanes. And we didn't lose a single one, which is very, during the Berlin airlift, we lost a lot of airplanes. You just can't keep pushing airplanes around a clock like that. And that's exactly what happened. There's an awful lot we could say about the uh, Operation Nickel Grasp. I don't think everybody here wants to hear about it. But anyway, yes, sir, your, your point's well taken. I would agree. No matter what you think about Nixon, one way or the other, folks, he wasn't going to let the Israelis down. <laughs> he went up. May I share with you something that I really don't have in any of my programs, but I think it's part of our spiritual heritage that needs to be mentioned. May I ask, how many here have heard of a heart shield Bible? Oh, wonderful. One man. Anybody else? Pastors, what did you hear about them? You. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Anybody hear about these from not me? <laughs> Nobody. Okay. All right, folks. May I share this with you here? All right. This is a heart shield Bible. The cover of this New Testament is 16-gauge steel covered with gold, hoping that, you know, it wouldn't rust as badly. They made three and a half million of these during the Second World War. Almost every Bible publisher was printing these things, and all kinds of moms and wives and girlfriends and sisters and aunts and grandmas would buy these and send them off to their airman or soldier, marine or sailor. And theoretically, it was designed to be worn in the left blouse pocket of a GI's uniform over his heart. That's why it's called a heart shield Bible. Now, I prefer the term armored Bible myself. I think that sounds cooler, armored Bible. Uh, some people call it a bulletproof Bible, but that's very inaccurate. Um, this would stop shrapnel or a bayonet or maybe a soft 22 caliber bullet, but it's not going to stop a, a jacketed rifle bullet, okay? But anyway, it is documented. These things did save lives. But the main thing I think is special about these is a whole lot of folks back home sent a whole lot of these to their fighting people so they'd have the word of God. And we believe Desmond Doss actually had a heart shield Bible given to him by his uh, girlfriend. That's what he received, okay? Now, the, you can still get these on eBay and Amazon. One that's in perfect condition like this is very expensive, but you know, the one I like the most is this one here. Do you know why I like this one the most? Guess what, Pastor? You can guess, I'll bet. Why do I like this one better than this one? This one's been used, folks. This thing is completely, the gold is worn off all around the edges. Some GI overseas use this New Testament a lot. That's why all the gold is worn off here. Is that cool or what? Um, Private First Class Nicholas, I think it's Jackson from Mom and Dad, 1944. So anyway, folks, it's just part of our spiritual heritage that we're losing. Heart Shield Bibles, three and a half million of these. Um, I did not know about these till the last year of my Air Force Reserve duty. I wish I'd known about them a lot sooner because uh, I could have used them a lot more. But there was one big problem. Today's military uniforms are much snugger, and I quickly found out that this thing is bulging out of my pocket way too much, and it's pulling my uniform down like that. And my chief master sergeant would get on my case and she'd say, Colonel, you look terrible. You got that bulge again. I said, Chief, that's the word of God. I'm sorry, sir. Take it up with the Lord, but you can't have that on your uniform. <laughs> so uh, they do weigh four to six ounces. So it is kind of a. <laughs> 
Many of these wound up in foot lockers, um, so at least hopefully they would read them still, uh, getting them from the foot locker. I knew Pastor would figure that out. But yeah, to me, folks, the one that has more character is the one that was actually used, don't you think? As opposed to one that just sat in a foot locker and never got read. Anyone else? I don't want to keep you too long. Going once, going twice, going three times. Well, we thank you so much for coming. I'll be in the resource area. If you have any questions or comments, may God bless you. May God bless the United States of America. And folks, we need to pray for Israel, don't we? Amen. And now, final message from our sponsor.